Dr. Herman Van Berkai. Uh, Herman is a architecture historian uh, at the Technical University, Del Delft University of Technology. He has he, he studied architecture, he studied architecture, art history, philosophy uh, in both the Netherlands and Venice, long time ago. He actually studied with Mathuri, which is an interesting kind of note, he shouldn't say anymore. Um, I know, he's so sad, right? <laughs> he's only 34. Um, um, Herman is uh, a specialist in Dutch modern architects, among other things. Um, in the early 90s, he published a major work on uh, a Dutch architect named uh, Willem de Dock. Um, and although he still doesn't do work on de Dock, he's still considered the kind of world expert. We know this because every time anyone does anything on de Dock, he gets invited. And he's always like, the book is 20 years old, really. And yes, he's still the one that always goes. Um, in March uh, this year, we're expecting a major uh, manuscript uh, to finally get into print. We've been working on that. Uh, on the Dutch architect, uh, Jan Dauber. Some of you may be familiar with Dauber's work, and Dock's work, uh, from some of Kimberly uh, Zarekor's lectures. Um, uh, Dauber, for instance, she might have shown you the open air school, uh, among other things. Um, Herman has taught many places. He taught at uh, University of Pennsylvania for a short time, uh, several programs in the U.S. and in Europe. I'm trying to do this without the notes, right? It's like, you can see, I'm testing my own memory right now. Yeah. Oh yeah, the most important part. Although he's a specialist in Dutch modern architects, he truly has a love and a fascination for 15th and 16th art, uh, century architects. So at some point we're expecting to see uh, some work from him on that uh, era. Tonight he's going to give a talk uh, primarily on another very important Dutch architect uh, named Verilaka. He will introduce that. Uh, but really the talk is about the importance of travel uh, for architects and how travel uh, informs their work and their thinking. And since the Department of Architecture, at least at the college, has the largest percentage of students who study and travel abroad, which we're very proud of, and we're trying to even give you more opportunities to increase those opportunities. Um, I hope this lecture will inspire you to make sure that you travel abroad uh, at least once, if not more than once, uh, during the course of your studies. So please help me welcome uh, Herman von der Can you hear me? Okay. Oh. Where should I start? Thank you, Deborah, for the kind words. I really had to force on her to tell her that my true love is for the architecture of the 17th and 16th and 15th century, because usually those periods are not considered by those people who study architecture as being very important for the curriculum. I had a little bit of trouble of naming this course, which is certainly not called input three. No signal. <laughs> what happened to the slide? You might think that this lecture is about an architect, a Dutch architect called H.P. Verlach. In a way it is, and in a way it isn't. In the sense that I'm not really here standing as an advocate for my own country, promoting the kind of architecture which we have in the Netherlands. I'm taking Verlach as an example of a way of traveling at the end of the 19th century. I'm taking Berlach because in his work and in his career we can clearly detect how he evolved from an architect being very much influenced by historical styles to an architect which we might call modern. 
and therefore I also have to say that the word model is very complicated in itself, which we will see. I was thinking to call it first a traveling architect, because today we call everything an art. There's the art of eating, the art of skating, the art of almost everything is an art, and we might ask ourselves, what is really the art of traveling? I was recently in Venice, and I gave a lecture there, and I saw that many people were walking through the city like this, with their GPS, being aware totally where they were at any moment. And I think that's not a way of traveling, that's only getting familiar with things you already know and checking them on a list, if that's really the case. With Bernard, it's different. He has a very open mentality towards a development in architecture into something new. He believed that architecture had to go into the direction of something new, although he didn't really know what way that could be. He had to find out, put together the little stones which in the end would constitute a building which in a certain way could be called modern. And a couple of years I discovered a manuscript which I published, of course, in Dutch, because I always do all my things in Dutch. I think if somebody else is interested, they should translate it themselves. About his first trip which he made, and he wrote many books, but he made a manuscript and never published this manuscript on his first trip to Italy, which is of 1880, which he did more or less straight after he had finished his studies at the University of Zurich. Also, that is very peculiar that a Dutch architect at that moment doesn't study in the Netherlands, but goes abroad and wants to be confronted by a different, with a different kind of culture, which is, of course, the switch culture, which is, in a way, is very peculiar also. Now, I'm taking Berlage as an example in the same way that I always take the Dutch architect as an example of illustrating what kind of problems are prominent there in their work and how they deal with it and how these evolvements have led to a different kind of architecture in the world as a whole. I could have taken also somebody like Le Corbusier and I'm sure that many of you are more familiar with Le Corbusier. I'm certainly not that familiar with Le Corbusier, because when I say Le Corbusier, I never know who I'm talking about. In the sense that everybody seems to have a notion already who Le Corbusier is, but nobody really knows what we are talking if we're talking about the young Le Corbusier, the old Le Corbusier, the old Le Corbusier, the dead Le Corbusier, or whatever Le Corbusier you wanted to name. Le Corbusier is also interesting, because you might say, well, he's somebody who transformed himself into an object, Le Corbusier, and his wife probably called him Le. They still don't really know what his wife called him. But even that, in a certain way, you might call, is a Dutch way of dealing with your own personality. Because when we look at a protagonist of the Dutch art movement to sell, maybe you've heard of that, one of the main protagonists was Mondrian, the man with the lines, everybody knows, and the primary colors. And actually the leader of that movement was Theo van Doesburg. Well, he called himself Theo van Doesburg. He invented a name for himself like Le Corbusier. But he didn't invent only one name, he invented three names for himself. He was born as Theo Coopers. He called himself as an artist and architect Theo van Doesburg. As a poet, he called himself Ika Bonzet. And as a futurist, he called himself Aldo Camini, almost as if he was an Italian. And he could write a review of his own work written under the pseudonym of Theo von Doesburg and totally disagree with it. Because his opinion was that that was not futuristic, that was elementarism, and that shouldn't be the case. So in fact, you could say that in that moment, somebody like Theo von Doesburg could become a world in himself. And that's the interesting part of it. How these people become problems, not only to the world, but also for themselves. How they develop their ideas without really noticing what kind of ideas 
they are really putting forward. In other words, it is not something very conscious, but architecture and dealing with architecture and the world around us is also something very unconscious, in which we have to find a certain way of being aware of what we are doing and how we are operating and how that transforms our vision of the world itself. Now on the right you can already see that the Dutch airplane company KLM considers Berlage as the most famous Dutch architect. And I would say, well, that's probably right in a certain way. He's a master, but then we have to discuss what is really a master and who were the followers, who were the dedicated followers of this man who developed a different kind of architecture. We could also look at books like this and see what other people have written about traveling in this moment as a tourist, or with the, the gates, and what kind of view you could have to the countries where you come. Or you can write a book about the architect's journeys. But that's not really what I'm interested in. I'm interested more in the mechanisms which an architect develops from his confrontation with a different kind of reality. And as I said, that has to be in a certain way conscious and not and how that remains to be noticed in his work in general. Now we can look at an office like this from the same magazine, or from the same magazine from the Kerlan, not the one with Berlach, but another kind. This is the office of the most famous Dutch architect nowadays, Herm Kallas, maybe you've heard of him. This is all he needs. It says the most effective workplace for Rem Kallas. It's an airplane seat. He has everything there, first class. He has his agenda. He has the magazine of the airplane company in his seat in front of him. And he can do everything there and scope over the world, see the world, and more or less when he's finished with traveling, as if three times over Cambodia or wherever he has been, he writes a book about it because he has seen everything. It's not really the scholar who tries to individualize the problems of a certain area, who tries to go into the library, pulls out the books. No, his is more going into the field and trying to experience what is happening there. This is certainly very different than somebody like Berlacher who had a room like this and would sit there at night in his little capsule with all his books there, with his pictures, with his drawings, and where he would contemplate of what architecture should be, how it should develop. Because he really had this belief that architecture had to be something new. It had to give an expression to the coming new society which was evolving within the Netherlands, first of all, but also in other places. He was trying to reform architecture into something else. And in that sense, you might say his traveling was fundamental because every time we see that it happens, it occurs at a certain moment, which gives a turn to his work as an architect. Let's say something about his education. As I've already said, he studied in Zurich. And it's very clear that he went to Zurich because there, there was a master of architect, Gottfried Semper, very well known, who had written a book, a very complicated book, which a lot of architects had read, the first 30 pages, and the other 600 they didn't read, because the first 30 are the most interesting, and the rest is more or less an explanation on examples, what he has written in those four 30 pages. And there he says that in art, nothing is really arbitrary. Everything has to follow its laws. That's one of the things we can pull out of this book. But maybe more interesting is, it was called Der Stiel. The Stiel in the tectonic and technical arts. And it was supposed to consist out of three volumes. The third one had to be in art, on architecture, and he never wrote that. Which is also very strange, you would say, as an architect, you would start thinking about that. But probably he never came to it or never had the will to finish that. But it is 
certainly the case that Berlach went to Zurich because he was fascinated by these kinds of theories, which a man like Semper, one of the few theorists of architecture in the 19th century, who came with a practical aesthetic, what he had written. Semper was fundamental because he was very much influenced by his own traveling and by his role within the German Revolution of 1848. He had been in London during the first expo there in 1851, had seen the Crystal Palace, and had also discussed his theories with somebody like Karl Marx. But when Berlach went there, and Berlach first of all wanted to be an artist, he conceived architecture as being an art. When he went to Zurich, of course, Semper was not living anymore. He was already dead. He went to Zurich in 1878. But there were the followers of Semper. And probably the followers are those who are even better in teaching the rules of the master. He was really instructed how he had to look at architecture through the eyes of Semper. But in itself, I've already indicated that the theory of Semper is very complicated because there are different strengths coming together. On the one hand, there is his concept of style. On the other hand, there is this concept that he has on the modification of forms. He was a naturalist. He thought new material would produce a new architecture. And on the other hand, he had this idea that architecture would fall apart into things which is the art form and the working form. With that, he introduced the concept which was, in a way, lethal for the old architecture. Because he disconnected the outside from the inside and more or less said, well, I have this structure, which I call the realm form, and over that I just put a facade and could do whatever I want. And Semper never got any further than being a very anti-Gothic man and pro-Renaissance. And you probably all know what Renaissance is. And you probably had a service course, so I'm sure I don't have to really explain what we have to understand under the word Renaissance. Now, if you think, and in that way I'm giving a lecture which is not very, um, with it, which is out of the order of normal history that, uh, lectures. I'm not really a historian which believes that the history can be taught by only examples. History is, in the first part, something which you live, which you embody yourself. You are your own history, and either you're interested in it or you're not interested. In the sense that you have to see that you are the carrier of the history of your parents. Now, if you know that, that your parents have produced you, and that you are the consequence of uh, amorous night or something else, then you start asking yourself, well, how did, have which kinds of phenomena, which kinds of genes became the strongest in myself? And you can also really, of course, start by asking the question, what's my name? You know, and I would ask him, what's the name? And he would say, but my name is William or whatever. And then I would ask, of course, the next question, who gave you that name? And his answer would be his parents. Now, I'm not interested in that kind of answer. I'm interested, who, which one of the parents? What's the power play with, within that parenthood? Who gives the name? Is it the woman who says, oh, we're going to give name in William? Or is it the man? Which mechanism produces these kinds of evolutions within the being of somebody particular? In that sense, that history has to be seen as a product of finding problems, identifying problems, and trying to catch out of the problem some sort of general aspect. There's no place of history. History books only deal with masters. They show you actually that which you cannot reach. Everybody wants to be a Le Corbusier. Everybody wants to be a Le Corbusier. There are Rencols. We have in Holland, we have about 100 Rencol houses walking around. There are so many of them, and they all think that they're going to be famous. And they will be famous for about five years, and then, of course, everybody will forget about it, like you forget a mediocre soccer player. Berlach is something different. In Berlach, we can really see how he tackles problems, and how he starts by trying to find out, how should I travel? So he buys this book, a German book, 
which explains at 1838 already how you have to travel abroad, and especially in Italy. Because, of course, that's the country where you have to go, because there you're confronted not with the Gothic, not with, I don't know which I've learned about Gothic. Normally, students learn that it's about the flying buttresses and the pointed arch and the vaulted rib, all kinds of nonsense. It's about a mentality. It's not about that. If you cannot catch the form from the mentality, then you have not really caught what's behind it. It's the same with Renaissance. I could say, well, the Renaissance is the use of columns. Uh, and they look at the Colosseum and they reproduce that way of production of the Colosseums in their own ways. Yeah, maybe that's only half of the, of the history, of the story, you might say. There's something more to it. The Renaissance, of course, everybody knows that the most fundamental device which the Renaissance has created is, of course, the perspective. You cannot think from the perspective, from that instrument, that device which pinpoints our position in confrontation to the external world, then you have not really understood what the Renaissance is about. It's about a representational problems. And that is, of course, very fundamental also for somebody like Berlach, because he wants to understand how these works of the Renaissance, which Semper discusses, and which also so somebody like Jakob Burkhardt discusses, how they worked within <coughs> Italian culture. So he bought himself this book, and this book, of course, describes everything which he had to learn a little bit of Italian, he had to learn how to use his money, how to go out. All these rules are given there. Now this are a couple of images that they're still that six portrait, five portraits of Berlach. There should be a foot, but you cannot really see it. And this is the final work with which he graduated in Zurich, which is more an adaption of the style of center itself. It looks like a center building. It's not very interesting. You might say that if he would work like that, he would probably be one of the many unknown architects of the 19th century. So why discuss somebody who's totally boring in a way? Because it's exactly that he becomes from somebody boring. He becomes somebody interesting because he knows how to identify certain problems and transfer them in a higher region. And that's especially when he goes to Italy. Because he goes to Italy with all the works in his luggage, with the books, which books like Der Cicerone from Burkhardt, with the books of Semper, with all these knowledge sources. But when we read the manuscript, we notice that he's not really interested in architecture at all. He's interested in the confrontation of architecture and society, how these two come together. He's interested in the girls. He's interested in the traffic. He's interested in the food. He's interested in all kinds of things which are maybe for him connected to architecture, but we don't really see that. It's a part of the living. And that's, of course, what he wants to arrive at. He wants to understand that art is not something which is dead, but is a representation of a living community. It expresses itself. And of course, Italy, for him, is a community who lives in the past with old forms, but it's transforming itself too. It's becoming an industrialized world. It's having problems of traffic. He notices. And when he talks about architecture, it's very boring because he just follows what Semper Burkhardt or anybody else had said. Interesting are those parts where he doesn't deal with architecture, but tries to understand what kind of relationship he can make between society and architecture how these two work together and form a dualistic thing. Interesting is also the way in which he notes, not only in words, but also in drawings, what he sees. You might suspect that he makes a lot of drawings of contemporary buildings. He doesn't. He's interested in how to teach his hand and sees it as a process of drawing almost banal things in a very childish way almost, obsessed by figuring out if he can use a certain technique in one way or in another way. If he should do it with a pencil, or 
maybe if he should do one harvest. Of course, he had everything with him. It's also known of Le Corbusier, who had this big camera walking through Italy and took his photos there. Bernard didn't have a camera, but he certainly had a lot of sketchbooks with him and other books. He probably had a trunk full, which he sent, of course, every time with a train to where he went. And one of the first stops after Turin was in Florence, where he made, of course, something like this, a snapshot, his tourist. Well, you can see that he's standing, and I didn't know he has the one with the tropical helm on. He loved helms. And he's standing where with three other friends who are clearly artists. And somebody later told me that the artist who's sitting there is some unknown Belgian artist who's making a caricature of who know what. They're making it almost like it is a mess en scène, and that it's a theater play of how they put themselves in front of the camera. So we are there in Florence, and we want to show that. We have a photo made of us, and we are all busy with something else. Berlach is standing there with a fiasco with the bottle in his hands, almost as if he's stubbing the form of the bottle in the way that somebody like Semper would study the form of bottles and daily materials, daily things, in order to understand how does that combine with what is going on in architecture. Now, we also have to understand that when Berlach went to Italy, he didn't go for a month. He didn't went to only make a couple of snapshots. He went for one and a half year. He wanted really to feel the Italian society in his skin. He wanted to participate. He writes about the Carnaval in Rome, how he participates. He writes about the Pope. He writes about everybody else. So again, he shows clearly his great interest in changes in the society itself and makes these kinds of almost nonsense drawings where you ask yourself, well, what can you get out of it? Nothing. It's just an exercise in hand. It's, he keeps it. He's in a way, he's shown that he's proud of it. He makes this, it's a pizza of some church which has no, he likes flowers. We can deduce that from a drawing like that. But for the rest, there's nothing really which we can learn about his drawing. He doesn't have a great technique. He's not educated in the way of drawing of John Ruskin. Again, like many of them were, thanks to his elements of drawing. But he can also make a little bit of decent drawings, like these, of watercolor, showing again his interest in monuments of the past, in which he really has no interest. He's just doing it because he knows he has to consume time. Time is not something which you just take very easily. You have to let it work on your brain. You have to take the patience in order to observe. If you don't take that, then you will lose what will be critical. Even if he doesn't know yet what is critical to him. All his drawings are more or less, in a way, they're very classical. Classical. But at the same time, what drawings are missing is the measurements, taking the measurements of the monuments. He's not interested in that. He's not interested in that kind of preciseness. He has an artistic view of how you should look at the world. And that becomes clear from even these kinds of drawings of statues of artists who are not really famous, who have nothing to tell. Yes, of course, there are these drawings again of something like Pompeii. He went to Pompeii. But if we ask him, what did you do with that? What did you see? And what did you try to capture in a drawing like that? Well, we don't really know, how, know what to answer. We can give a lot of answers, but it's not very clear if it's really that important. And there are, of course, these study drawings which every architect should do, even the architects of the day. Just making something like that, understanding how shadows work in the capital of the order of the, the Ionic order, or making a drawing like this. Strangely enough, drawings of life which he puts into words in his manuscript are hardly there. They're all these kinds of drawings, drawings of dead objects in a very dead way. I'm just showing you this is the Palazzo Este in Tivoli show clearly that indicating that he was there. Sometimes they're nicer, 
Uh, there's some sort of composition, of course, he's instrued that he has to put also a composition, he has to use that. He thinks still that he wants to be an artist. He exercises the hands, and sometimes he takes more time, and the drawings become a little bit more interesting. So what is the importance of this first trip? You might say this virgin trip to Italy, this confrontation with, of course, a culture which is totally against what somebody in the Netherlands would see. Don't forget that the Netherlands were, of course, one of the most modern states in Europe. The Netherlands in the 16th century, that's why I like the 16th century, is the first state who rebels against everything. Not only against the Pope, Rome is not worth anything anymore, so we're against the Pope, and we're also against the king, the empire. And of course, in that moment, you can ask, well, who are you for? What's the etiquette? If you don't acknowledge the Pope and the King, then you have nothing to rely on. You have to invent your own language. And that's maybe very typical of the Dutch culture. We invent our own language by creating myths, by saying that the first Bible was really written in Dutch. And that the Dutch are the only ones who can really talk. They are not captivated by images. No, we are captivated by abstractness, by the whiteness, by the screen on which we can project everything. Think about some of the painters in Holland who paint these white churches in which there is no history anymore. We start all over again. It's an attitude which is still alive. Somebody like Rem Collas thinks he can discover the fundamentals of architecture. Finding somebody from, found the fundamentals of architecture. I wonder what you, where, where did he find that? Probably in his closet. Yeah, oh, look, fundamentals. As if not acknowledging that there is something, there is a corpus of knowledge on which you can rely on, which you can to understand what kind of turn you can give to those kinds of things. We're not discovering the world every time new. We're working in these kinds of places, and sometimes we are proud of working in these kinds of secluded places, like Berlach has, and you can see on the wall, he has these Roman things, pictures which he bought in Rome or in Florence, and he still has them here in his old age, he's already 70 here, he still has them on the wall. He doesn't have the modern Mondian paintings hanging there and saying, hey, this is who I am. No, this is something he's, you can clearly see from his office, that those are things which he has appropriated, which are his. He has internalized his travels. He has uh, his travels. He has thought about it and said, yeah, they mattered. They did something to me. And finally, after a while, I understood what I was looking at when I was young. That took, of course, a little bit of time. His first words, when he came back from his one and a half trip to Italy were very dull. He would buy, make something he worked together with an engineer. Also, that's a very clever thing to do. He worked with a very famous engineer in Amsterdam who was interested in making traffic systems, the tram, and who needed an aesthetic uh, advisor. And Berlach said, well, I can do that. I can make nice pictures. And so even his first magazine, this is a good uh, magazine, his first uh, architectural project looks very, you might say, Venetian. I've put here a picture of the Palazzo Vendermin Canderbi, which she has seen and which she uses, but you can also see there are different elements in the picture itself. There are these elements at the top, which more or less seems as if he has taken them away from the main town hall of Amsterdam. It's more or less a sort of mix of all kinds of things. But what you can see in a drawing like this is that he's very proud. How can you see that? I show this to my students in the Netherlands and they say, oh, because he colored it or something like that. Yeah, or because he made a little dog there black and he liked dogs or something like that. But it's obvious. It's there in front of us. He put a frame around it. He framed his own drawings already, saying that this is a piece of art, this I really want to keep, I'm going to make it. He probably took more care of making the framework around it than in the drawing itself. 
indicating how much attention he wanted to give to something like this as a piece of art. His work as a piece of art. It's a building from 1884, but in 1884 he also wrote two articles in a Dutch magazine in which we can learn what kind of ideas he had about his family. His first article is called Amsterdam and Venice. Now that seems very appropriate, as we still call Amsterdam the Venice of the North. But actually, what he does here is he lies. He doesn't tell us the whole truth, in the sense that he's introducing Amsterdam and Venice, he's been to Venice, but most of the article is about Paris. <laughs> and that's a clear indication that he's wanting to introduce something in which he's not really that familiar with. He sees Venice as something which is picturesque. That's his concept. Venice is a picturesque city. Paris is, everybody knows, Paris is monumental. And what he wants to say is Amsterdam has to be monumental and picturesque. It has to be both. Even if these concepts are contradictions, and you cannot be both. Nowadays, of course, everybody knows that after Ford you can be anything. And we have an alternator, we have an S, we have so many personalities. We are carriers of conflicts. But it's almost as if he tries to figure out how he can introduce two kinds of concepts within one city. Amsterdam has to be monumental, which it isn't, so it needs monuments. And that's, of course, what he's stressing, that if society in Amsterdam wants to establish a relationship with reality, it has to create new kinds of monuments. It has to think big. Also, that is something which the Dutch love, thinking big. We like that concept because, of course, it's a very small, small country, and it's a little bit that exaggerating who you are. The second article is about the St. Peter in Rome. And that's very interesting because he gives an historical view of what the St. Peter is. And he tells the whole story about St. Peter, and the project of Marmonte, then comes Michelangelo, then comes that, the Bernini, the whole history. And he doesn't really tell us what his main question is. His main question is, how is it possible that we can look at something like the St. Peter and see it as a unified building? In other words, how is it possible that we cannot detect these different styles of different architects of different periods and through a sort of layer of patina, they all become the same? In other words, how is it possible that our eye lies to us and tells us what we have to see as something beautiful? In other words, we cannot really trust what our eye is doing, but we have to dismantle, we have to dissect reality and try to look what's underneath it. And every time we see that in his writings, because he wants to be also a theoretical architect, he has this way of trying to find out what is the direct relationship between the project and that what I'm trying to discover. So even in those very young projects which he makes, and another project of 1885, is a sanatorium. Now his reasoning is very easy. Sanatorium, if you go there then you're, you have some sort of disease, you're ill, so the air has to be purified, where do you find purified? Uh, Eric, you find them in Switzerland. Everybody knows that Thomas Monter, Sauerberg. So what he does is he transforms something which he knows from Switzerland. He makes a chalet architecture in the Netherlands. Very clear. Sanatorium, that has to be like that. A very direct reasoning for how to get to it. He thinks I have to reason about it. I have to find the concept. I have to tell people, well, this is why this project is so good. Now something really strange happens in 1886, in which again he reflects on his traveling when he participates in the competition for the facade of the Dome of Milan. This is a fabulous drawing, two meters high, very well executed. Colored, here yeah, you cannot see the colors really, but you can see that there is a little bit of indication of the building itself. Now his reasoning is again very clear. 
I have to make a building, I have to make a facade, the face to a building which is Gothic. Now, the only building which he knows in which is Gothic in Italy, and he doesn't really like the Gothic, is the dome of Orvieto. So he puts a lot of triangles there, and he does a lot of stuff. He just copy and pastes, you might say. If he had a computer, it would have been much easier for him. And you can see that also the whole, yeah, the whole thing is, yeah, in a way, a little bit strange. But the most strange part is that which we see directly in front of us. They're asking for a facade. And what does Bernard do? He gives them something else. He gives them, beside the facade, he gives them an enormous campanile, tower, clock tower, which they didn't ask for. And you might say that the whole campanile is as interesting as the whole building next to it. But he needs that. For some reason, he wants a company. Again, we can understand his reasoning because we know he has seen Italian examples, for example, that of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, where you have the Giotto Tower next to it. So he makes this tower, which in itself is a complication of enormity, of strange things coming together. It's a company, it has the clocks, and it has another earthly clock on top of it, which you cannot really see. It's so high up. And on the top, you can almost see that he re repeats the church facade again. But that's not really interesting. What is interesting is why does he need that tower? What does he really need it for? And that's where you can see that his mentality is again going towards a societal problem. He sees not so much the architecture as the town plan behind it. He wants to see that tower as a pivoting point between different spaces. He wants to define space. He doesn't want space flowing around the tower. No, he wants that tower there in order to break a square in front of it, to produce a square in front of it, like in Florence, and a square next to it. So actually, what he's trying to come up with is a town planning solution to how you can indicate, how you can how you can um, arrest a building in the city tissue itself, how you can connect it, how you can make it a part of the city and not make it like an isolated object. Now that's a theory which in the same time comes up, for example, in town planners' uh, work like Camillo City, where we see that is the same interest, how do you create spaces which gives you security? In other words, not free-floating spaces, but play places where you have something behind you, where you feel secure because there is something behind you which protects you. An interesting project. Even more interesting is when you can see that he becomes interested in France. He gets acquainted with the work of Violet Le Duc. And he goes to France and he writes again about it, a little trip through northwestern France. Immediately he has to put his experiences of his traveling in words. Every time again we see that there is this reflection on traveling in word and images. Now there are no images of this trip. A lot of photos, because he could buy the photos of all the great cathedrals in France and just put those into his connection, in his collection. But what is strange is that you can see that here he introduces more or less uh, adversary to center. He comes with Violet Le Duc and creates more or less a combination which will be very productive in the future. In 1889, he participates in an exhibition for the French Revolution at the World Expo in Paris in 1889. And he makes a drawing which he knows will be seen by everybody. Because this is a drawing, only part of it, of about six meters long. How long is six meters? Yeah, more or less the size of that screen. Everybody has to see it. And not only the size, again, bigness, Hey, if you want bigness, then if you want to be noticed, you make something so big. Not only that is interesting, also interesting is that he comes up with three names for the same project. He calls it on the one hand a monument historique, an historical monument. Then he calls it 
a project of a mausoleum, and he also calls it a monument crematoire. So a crematorium. Three things. And you might ask yourself, why make something enormous like that and give it three titles? And how do these three titles work together? We all know that three things always take care that there's a complication. Already Vitruvius, you probably know who Vitruvius is when he comes with Venustas, Firmitas, and Udilitas. We know those three concepts, they don't really work together. They stand in opposite poles, they form a triangle. Every time that is the same, if it's the three in uh, religion, or the three in theory, or the three wherever, yeah, liberté, equalité, and liberté, complex. Yeah, and then you, can, you get so many conflicts in something like that. And you have to find out, you have to really dig in order to f understand what his modus is for producing something like this, which is in itself a great mold of all architectural styles. He puts everything together, what he knows. He makes a building which is enormous, but at the same time indicating that this is a crematorium. And you cannot already understand, this cannot be a crematorium in which you burn the bodies. No, something else has to be burned here. That said, right, it's a monument historique. He wants to burn history. He wants to get rid of this burden which he sees as history, as saying, prescribing what style it's in. He wants a new style. He wants something else. He wants to liberate himself, but he doesn't really know how he can liberate himself from his own education. He's still obsessed with the Renaissance. And we can see that, that when he makes a project a year later for a town hall in Holland, it's again a very dull building. It's a Dutch Renaissance building. OK, yeah, he wants something Dutch. He hasn't really understood that Dutch Renaissance building is in itself something which is almost un understandable. Because it's, again, that aspiration towards a new language of architecture, which doesn't really work, but which has all these signals of wild white stones in it. It has no unif unified image. Also there, if you look at this, you can see that it's really strange how we how it emphasizes the emptiness around the building itself. There are people walking around, but you cannot say really that they define the square around this building. It is as if he doesn't understand the lessons which he has produced before. But what he does do, again, is he frames the whole thing. He puts a nice frame again and says, well, if you don't like it, at least you can consider it a sort of painting. You can hang it on the wall, which is really, again, an indication that he still believes that architecture is the major art and that all the other firms should follow that. Now, the influence of Violet Le Guin, we see back when he starts designing churches. Very dull churches, not really important. He only makes it because he wants to be a famous architect, so he participates in these kinds of competitions and makes these really strange drawings for me certain point of view. He also gets commissions in which, on the one hand, he deals with the problem of monumentality, in which he thinks that the monumentality should be put forward in the material which he uses. So he uses German bricks, German stone, in an environment in which normally bricks are used in order to indicate that it's a special building for this kind of insurance company. And he also indicates that he uses the building not only as a publicity building, but integrates also the writing. He puts the Algemeene, the general, on top of the building, showing that the building is more or less a publicity for its own firm. Also, these kinds of drawings show that he's dealing with the problem of monumentality, how he can use symmetrical axis. This is for a play which he made in 1894. Not really spectacular. But then there comes a crucial moment. He starts, he gets the commission from a professor in Groningen of all places. Groningen is not very central in Holland, so you might say it's in the outskirts. And this professor tells Berlach, I want you to make a house for me. And it doesn't have to be representational. I work in Groningen. Nobody really ever comes to Groningen. So it doesn't. I want a house which is for me and my wife and for the work that I do. 
And so Berla asked the man, what kind of work do you do? Well, the man says, I'm a professor of philosophy. And that immediately arouses the attention of Berla because he has always had this interest for philosophy. But the man says something more. He says, I'm also a professor in experimental psychology. Now, Berla has never heard of that. The man wants a laboratory where he can do his, his um, test on experimental psychology. So he asks, what, does, what do you do? And the man says, I'm interested in how people make images, how they see images, how the gaze in itself is diffused at the edges, and how there is a central focal point, and how that shifts when people move through the how that, move take, that movement occurs. And at that moment, Berlach thinks, oh, that's actually what I'm interested in, too. I'm not only interested in making buildings which are idealized, I'm also interested in how people look at my buildings. I want to have an effect in my buildings. And in order to have an effect, I have to calculate how people, how much time they have in order to see my buildings. And what he understands is that the whole Renaissance, with all these little details, is an art of the past which is not really necessary. What you have to do is you have to put strong elements somewhere where everybody sees them. And that takes away the attention from all the weaker parts of the building itself. He comes with an article which he calls Architecture and Impressionism, in which he clearly, on the one hand, tries again to tie architecture to an artist movement like Impressionism, but also wants to deal with the fact of how do you make an impression? What is necessary and how does the eye look at a building? And he comes to the conclusion that I can economize much if I just use my energy, put my energy in those moments which I am sure that people will see. But not only that, the building itself is remarkable. Because you might say that there has never been an architect who has made such an ugly building. And that's fundamental. He starts thinking about ugliness. In the sense that there is not something, a regulator, from the outside inside, but from the inside out. He understands that there is also a way of making a building, and especially a living space like a house like this, from the inside out. And that it doesn't have to be representational, but that you more or less can see on the outside what will happen on the inside. Then he has the problem where he's going to put the main door. And if people will really find that main door. So what does he do? He puts there a white collar to signalize that where the main door is. In other words, he wants to put a representational element only there where he's sure that it's needed, that the postman can find the door. And for the rest, the whole house is made as a service towards, on the one hand, the wife of the professor, and on the other hand, the laboratory. It's designed from the outside, from the inside out, which is a procedure which is very modern at that time. What we also see is that he doesn't frame his work anymore. He still has this little education. No, he stamps his work now. He brands his work, you might say. Yeah, and puts a little thing there, you know, also with the plants. But for the rest, he doesn't have that idea that it's a work of art in itself, which has to be indicated by the framework. No, the building in itself. And you can see, he theorizes, he comes with a theory of ugliness. Very typical Dutch, in the end, he concludes that also ugly is very beautiful. If you use it in a right, right way, and that when it's not really needed, he doesn't have to compete. He makes an ugly building because that's what the client wants. It's not really that much a monumental building. It has all these little strange things. But what he's also interested in is in how the eye works. He did a building in the same year, which is also a very ugly, for an insurance company. Very clear is always that his architecture is often for insurance companies, something which is very fundamental for the 20th century. He makes this in the Hague. And he understands that people cannot really read this building. It's too complicated. It has a roof zone which is fragmentized. 
and he doesn't want that. He understands that if you want to capture the image of the building, you only have a certain amount of time. You have to understand it as quick as possible. So you have to have clear forms. So when he gets two years later, he gets the opportunity to change it. He randomly changes the top. He makes it into an Italian palazzo still, with a tower standing up. But it's more that clear-cut cubic form which he produces. It's much easier to recognize. It's much easier to have an image of the thing itself in your mind. Everything you can also see in the windows. The windows are also uniformed. It's not anymore trying to be spectacular by making all different kinds of windows. No, he's looking for a serial approach of those elements which he can use without actually uh, diluting the form. That's also very clear from his main building, the Burst, the Stock Exchange in Amsterdam. We see that this is one of the first drawings which he made, in which the tower is very much like a church tower. The choir is almost something which comes up, and it looks like a church, and then in the end, he makes it like something like this. Now, this is a fundamental building from 1901, which many modern architects, Peter Beer and so Mies van der Rohe was very much impressed by it, by the soberness, by the use of the brick, by the radical way that he denounces all these ornaments. Yes, there are still very little ornaments to be seen, but also the way that he makes no compromises between brick and steel. He uses both and puts them cold against each other. And you can see that this is the main court, which is covered then by a steel structure. And he does makes no attempt to make the beautify something like that. It's all calculated in a very strict way, as is also the plan. It's based on the use of the square, and strangely enough, he complicates by using the triangle, the Egyptian triangle, for the facade. And there's somebody who tells him, hey, Berla, you're still too complicated. You're using two forms in order to get an image of the building, which is on the one hand the triangle, and on the other the square. You should have used only the square. And he's aware that there's something strange that he cannot really deal with all the contradictions in his buildings. He looks at all the contradictions, because he wants still to, be, to make a building which is on the one hand picturesque, and on the other hand very monumental. And you can see it in a building like that, like this, that two of the facades are very monumental, the one towards the more representational buildings in Holland, and the two other facades are clearly have the intention to tie, to tie themselves to the urban tissue around it. And on the one hand, he also wants to make a building which defines a street very well, more or less the only boulevard which Amsterdam has, which is the connection between the main square and central station. He wants to be there in a dominant place. In fact, he does the same thing in a building in Leipzig, in Germany, also for an insurance building. He uses a steel framework and then covers it with brick. He makes that little drawing of it, but tries to simplify it as much as possible. Makes it into a very monumental building. And then he starts traveling again. And he goes, of course, to the United States. He writes a book in 1930 of his trip in 1911, where he goes to the United States. And he sees the work of Sullivan. And he's probably one of the first who introduces also Frank Lloyd Wright in Europe. Not through drawings. There are no drawings of his trips to the United States, but there are photos. And very impressive is also that he starts with a quote first, which he leaves in English. And he takes it of Emerson. Because he sees in Emerson a representative of somebody who doesn't look at history, but who looks at nature. Nature is the inspiring force from which the new kind of architecture should derive. Not history anymore. History is seen too much as a burden, too much as an intellectualization of the past. But he sees this, that the nature, this America has everything ahead of us because it's not tied up to any historical vision of architecture. And he produces also these kinds of 
photos of the work of Frank Dirk Wright, the Larkin Dome. And actually, you might say that Berlach is one of the main sources for the influence, for the great influence that Frank Lloyd Wright had in Europe, because he was one of the few architects who was also capable of buying the Westmund edition, which was very expensive. So all those young architects who worked in the office of Berlach at night would go through the Westmund edition and see what Frank Lloyd Wright was doing in the United States. In 1911, he makes the Holland House in London. There are some drawings of his traveling to London. But what we see here is more or less how he introduces America in London. He uses the steel structure, the steel skeleton, and then he covers that with faience stuff. But he makes a very simple building, very regular in its structure, with a door with these pilonses very un-English, and of course the English saw it also as an obstrosity in their own town. But he does keep on drawing, and we see that, for example, in drawings like these. I'm just going to show you some of his drawings which he made after 1915. This is a drawing from Rotterdam. He keeps exercising his hands again and again, trying to understand how we can make pictures, how we can look at reality. And you can see that slowly from that not being able to draw in his travelings to Italy, he comes with beautiful drawings, which are very abstract, which are very quick also, which have a sort of rigor to it because he puts all these lines or even when he makes these windows which are very unclear. But he tries to come with his own style of drawing. Sometimes by putting up the whole drawing in pencil or in uh, wax and then only indicating little points with color. Beautiful drawings. Worth book in 1922. In 1921, he made a project for the Municipal Museum in The Hague. And he comes again with this monumental project, which looks like almost an orientalization of the Dutch Museum. He comes with this pantheon, he likes to call it always pantheons, these big cupels, very heaviness. And this project this was enormous, didn't get executed, because in that period, 1922, Holland went into a depression, and there was almost no work. So what you see is that Bernard starts thinking, how can I find work? And he comes with the idea that he should go to the Dutch Indies. He should lecture abroad. So he, I have to go faster. So he plans a trip to the Dutch Indies, which is probably one of the most famous and interesting travels. You can see him here arriving at the Dutch Indies in his tropical helmet, almost like a like an imperious, he finds that he has to dress in the way that everybody does, but he makes these drawings, he gives lectures, and he's paid for his lectures, actually. He makes more money out of this trip because he's a consulate for the restoration of the temples in the West Indies, in the Dutch Indies, and he makes lectures and he makes drawings, which he puts into an exhibition. All these drawings are of one form, more or less, and he immediately frames them in a passport to ready to be shown for the public. And what is interesting is, of course, that he's here confront, confront, uh, confronted with a culture which is totally nice. He doesn't know how to react, but he's trying to understand what is so peculiar about the Dutch Indies. It's something which he's interested in because what he sees is that architecture should not only indicate something which is rational, but also something which is irrational. And the Dutch Indies were for many Dutch people, they were something mystical, which they didn't understand. As if the whole country was determined by forces which they called black forces, which were mystical in themselves, which came more or less from the countryside. So he tries to capture the countryside. He tries to understand one of the key terms of 20th century architecture, the genius logic of the place itself. He sees that there is something special, that they try to translate the spirit of the place in a different way. That is not that rationalization. 
that he cannot come forward every time with a Descartesian view of a Spinozian view of reality, but he has to admit also that there is spirituality. And he feeds more or less Dutch expressionism of the Amsterdam School. He comes with a lot of drawings also of these towns. And of course, again, he writes a book about his travel. And what we see from these travels, from these drugs is that he's fine capable of translating his ideas into a drug. He knows with these line drugs, he knows how to make perfectly, especially compared with the old early drugs. And for the rest of his life, in every travel, we see that he comes with these kinds of beautiful drugs, like this of Venice, or another one of Venice. You might ask yourself, but well, what's the influence now of this in his work, of a great trip to the Dutch Indies. And we can see more or less in this reduction, in this trying to find a new kind of monumentalism, which is reduced to the maximum. This is a cover for his book on the design for a square in, in Rotterdam, and he only uses the contour. Only like it captures immediately to your attention, and it doesn't say anything. You can almost introspect everything. And sometimes in a building like this, where he uses, as one of the first architects, the infill principle that he makes a steel uh, concrete structure and then fills it in with bricks. But what is very important is that somebody like Berlach, through the influence of somebody outside the profession, is pushed in a different direction. And that occurs in the house of Heimans. And that is especially clear, clear that when Heimans died in 1924, they found in his pocket a self-portrait in which he shows the plurality of in interpretation of reality. Thank you very much. Exploded. 
And what you see is that the, the generation of all the people who come after him, they have that. They don't have any knowledge of history yet. But he still has history. He sees that history is, history is for him very important. He's one of the turning points. Yeah, he's, a, he's, he's really a turning point. And you might say he remains with, certainly with one leg in the 19th century. But I think the 19th century, in a way, is much more interesting than the 20th century. Only we like the 20th century because, in a way, it's very banal. And we think that the 19th century, that, for example, is eclectic, and we don't really know what eclectic is because we think that eclectic means that it's taken there and randomly we take it. And that's not true. Eclectic is very scientifically organizing things and trying to come to a new style based on using certain elements that it didn't work. That's just uh, the, the, the result of the time, the complication.
No, I didn't say that. Wait, I didn't say that you should look at it. But I am looking at it. That would be false. I say that you have to see architecture as the result of a struggle and not something easy which you take out of the magazine or whatever. You have to have ideas and you have to know that you can follow somebody very and try to be a Le Corbusier or try to be an Eisenman or try to be one of these examples which are even more boring in a way because they don't have to, they don't tackle anything. They don't really know their street. You can see in Berlin he's struggling. He's trying to find an answer to a problem which he doesn't really know how to formulate yet. And that's what you are doing. You shouldn't look like something which, I mean, everybody can sing like uh, something which is already known. It's to find your own voice. And what you can see is that somebody like Berlach is trying to find that own voice. And he doesn't know what his own yet is. He sees the complications of the society which is changing, and that's fundamental. His architecture is something which you might say is a result of an art, uh, an artistic mentality, but it's also a result of much more. That is not so, he's not looking for fame. No, he's posing the problems and says, I don't care if I find the answer yes or no, maybe in my next building. And my next building will not, because I didn't get to build it there, will be the same. No, I have to look at other conditions. I'm looking more interested, or I'm more interested in tackling problems than giving a clear solution. And that's uh, what I'm interested in. I'm much more interested in something like Berla, and I find his work much more interesting than, for example, Out, who immediately knows what he's doing, and then, OK, yeah, where, there we have it. Yeah, but in Berlin, you can see that this transpiration yeah, is much more in, uh, interesting than the inspi inspiration which he has. And every yeah, he's dealing with the whole world and he says, how can I? You know, all these philosophers, and he writes articles about uh, aesthetics from Plato to Schopenhauer, and you can see he doesn't know what to do with it. There's so much knowledge. So he struggles with all these information sources which are coming towards him. And even when he writes, he doesn't make a clear statement. You can see that he steals their article, he steals them, and he puts everything together. And you say, what the hell is he doing? So yeah. when your teachers yeah. say to you, your, the paper you wrote is completely incomprehensible, say, I've been reading Berlacher. <laughs> no, you should, say, you, should, you should say, if that's the problem, then you haven't really understood it. Because the complication is that it's not very clear, and you cannot really force it very clear. There's always a different solution. You don't say something else. If you want to be, just take something over, then you take something over, but you have to come with an explanation again. You have to uh, justify it for yourself. Bernard is trying to justify it all the time. He doesn't want to feel like an isolated figure. So he takes quotes from Schumacher, from all these Germans, and of course the Germans are always the one who put modernity towards the extreme, next to the Dutch. I always say the Dutch are the most perfect Germans because we go always one step. <laughs> then we have painters who just say, well, this is the painting. It's a white screen. It's, it, we haven't done anything. Just project, project whatever you want on it, because that is it. Thank you. Any, any final questions? Otherwise, Chairman? Uh, I just have a few final okay. observations. When you introduced the lecture in Malacca, the idea of the embodiment of the world, it seems to me only in the travelogue is he able to actually make us conscious as viewers of his drawings of his proximity to the world. Where when he's drawing his own work, that distance changes radically, right? Where we see the whole thing, we don't just see a portion of the world, right? Which, which in, that, in that sense is a, is a sort of removal of self in the realm that he is in fact do you Do you think what? about that yourself at all? Yes, because he wants to he wants to reason about it. So you can see his his work is over reason. So, so the drawing and especially when he writes it's more getting close to it, uh, understanding it more. Yeah, he used to work and there are only a couple of articles which are really interesting. Also the rest is interesting, but it's more interesting for if you if you get into the thing so, But of course he's on the one hand, he doesn't want to give up architecture as being something spiritual. But he doesn't know where to find that spirit. He says everything is gone. Yeah, this is gone. Yeah. We have to create something. So how can architecture be something else as mere building? He doesn't want to accept, like Gropius, that building is, is architecture. Now, building has to be the representation of society. 
it has to give the directions to society. It has to participate in society, and it cannot be transposed from one place to the other, but should also calculate what is happening in a certain place. He doesn't manage that. He goes to the Dutch Indies, and he wants to understand what is underneath that spirit. He feels the vibration. And the vibration comes back in his drawings with all these lines, more or less. But in his work, it's, mis it's less. Because he doesn't, he's, he's afraid of making that last leap. But in that sense, he's giving you much more information than somebody who just, oh, we're making the last leap. Yeah. Yeah, because that's all gone, and now I make something every time perfect. Because they don't have all that luggage. They've already done, that Berla has thrown away all that luggage for them. Perfect. Thank you very much.